Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. While you're turning there, we um, ask that you pray uh, for the, a lot of churches, you know, and it's not so much as it is locally, but there's a lot, a lot of the Lord's churches that don't have pastors. And they're small, and they're struggling, and they just need the Lord. Second, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, in the very first verse, the Bible says, Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are thou not least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor, and shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent to Bethlehem, and said, and he sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when thou hast found him, bring me word again that they that I may come to worship him also. And when they departed, uh, and when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before him till he came and stood over where the young child was. And when he saw the star, he, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. And when they were coming in into the, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you for the good place that you've given us to meet together this morning. God, we, help, uh, we pray your help as, as a people together that we've come for the right reason to this place this morning. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you fill this place with the Holy Ghost. Lord, that it would speak our, uh, to our hearts and our minds and that it would make this word a living word. God, help the lost that meet among us that you might touch their hearts and prick them and make them understand and know that thou art God. We pray for salvation of the lost that meet with us, God, that you might uh, do a wondrous work of grace in their life. And God, those of us that are saved, that you might do a wondrous work of grace in us, that, that we might be thrilled to be in your house this morning, that we might be happy to meet among your people. God, give us help to preach. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, some uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture often preached concerning Christmas, which I reject in a large part, but really what it is telling is how to worship God, how to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, and how His worship is different than the worship of God. It's a story of transition, and it's a story of a group of men that meant business with God. You know why most of the time, uh, and most Baptists by and large don't even really uh, understand worship? is because we didn't come on business uh, in the first place. Uh, we came out of routine. We, you, you, you know what routine it really is? It's religion. Uh, I routinely or religiously brush my teeth every morning, but there's no benefit there for the soul. Now, it may be a little bit of benefit for my teeth, and sometimes I'm unconvinced on that, but there's really no benefit, spiritually seek, uh, speaking, concerning 
religious things. Uh, ju just doing things out of repetition is really no help to you at all if you follow it in the strictest sense. So these men meant business. And we'll see the effort that they put out just to come to the place where they did. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, I want you to see that many people feel like that where they came from is present-day Iraq. And possibly Jews that had been displaced there, or maybe even uh, descendants of Esau, who also went in that direction, and they uh, they came uh, they came because of a drawing. Now we'll find that this star was unusual, and I don't even know these people were born again. I don't even know if they were Jews because there weren't very many Jews in the area that they came from. Now, from Iraq to Jerusalem is 549 miles. Now, if, uh, if you travel that by camel, uh, the best I can say, I, I said a camel would go about as far as a horse would in a day, which is about 20 miles at a regular space. It would took them a month just to travel. Now, probably because it was completely across desert land, uh, it, it even took longer than that because when you're crossing desert land, you have to go slow. Most of the time, you have to stop for a long period in the day because the sun's too hot, and the only route you can take is where there's water. So it probably took much, much longer than it did just as a 540 mile, 40 nine mile trip but I want you to see that to do that you have to be determined now we know nothing about desert here in Tennessee there is a desert in the United States one of the largest ones in the world but I've never seen a desert don't know what one looks like well I'll take it back I've seen it from a plane and that's as far as I want to get whenever one time when I went and preached in Idaho I had to go down to Phoenix and make an exchange and come all the way back. Now, uh, on my way to Phoenix, we went across some deserts, and I had a window seat, and I looked down, and there was nothing, just miles and miles and miles of sand. And every once in a while, there'd be a big circle of green where someone had brought the water in. Now, apparently that's a new, a new way to farm, is to provide your own moisture. And every once in a while you'd see one of them, uh, besides that, there was nothing. And so what that tells me, sometimes there's going to be some dry times, sometimes you're going to have to go through the desert to meet with Christ. And sometimes it takes a long, long, long time. Now, in the average American church today, and when I say that, I use it in the strictest of sense, I mean our type of churches, we want something immediately, and we want it right now. See, you're not, you're not willing to travel through the desert. You're not willing to go the long way around. But if you really want to meet with God, you better change your thinker, because that's exactly what it takes if you want to meet with God. So we find the characteristic of these men, if they were Esau's descendants or whomever they were, the, the Bible calls them wise. The Bible uh, says they're intelligent. The wise man said, uh, the Bible said, you know, uh, you know, and uh, you know the little Christmas songs, we three kings of oriented are. There's never indication that they were royalty. All it said was that they were smart. It never says there were three of them. It could have been a whole band of them. I don't know. Uh, uh, the little three men of oriented are they just because they bought three gifts. But you know what? It didn't say every one of them brought a gift, did it? And so we find a group of men that the Bible says was wise, that were smart, that understood some things. And, and so we find that it is a very wise thing if we really depend on seeking God, if that's our intent. Verse 2, and they got to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? 
For we have seen his star in the east. They came from the east side of Jerusalem back west toward the Holy Land, and we are come to worship him. Now, I want you to, if you underline in your Bible, you underline the word worship because, see, that means business with God. We're going to see that everything we do is not worship. You know what? It's a wonderful, joyous thing, and I love it. But mostly when I preach, what we're really doing, if you get down to where we're at, we're just studying the Word of God. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a wonderful, blessed thing to do. But it's not worship. It's not coming before the Lord with your hands lifted high. It's not coming before the Lord and saying, Blessed be the name of Christ. Blessed be the Holy One of Israel. It's none of that. So they, find, they traveled over 500 miles across the desert just to worship. Just to come. And you know what? Jesus at this point was a child. Probably about two years old. And you know what? They didn't even come for a sermon. They just wanted to worship. A two-year-old child doesn't preach. Now, Christ could have if he wanted to at that age, but he submitted himself to the flesh, so he didn't. See, uh, uh, like my two-year-old grandson back there, uh, he can't preach a sermon. One reason he don't have a real good, a two-year-old don't have good use of the language yet. And, and so all they come to do was worship God. They, they weren't interested in a sermon. They were interested in worship. Verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was excited. He was troubled. And why was he troubled? It's because the title that these men said, I'm come to worship the king of the Jews. Now, that's the next element. If you really want to worship, he's king. He's king. He, he, he's the one. He's first thing. You, you know, that's one thing with Armenian doctrine concerning salvation where you can accept him when you're ready. That gives him no kingship. So you don't have to, you know, Queen Elizabeth, the, long, the longest reigning monarch in English history, you know why she's queen? Because what she says goes. And everybody says, well, now they're under a different sign. You know what? Every day the chief of parliament goes to the queen and says, what do you think about this? So she, she, she is in control. And see, this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ is in control. And if you come to worship him any way but that way, I don't know who you're worshiping, but you're not worshiping the king. And, and, and so we find then that uh, what upset him was he was afraid of his own, his own ruling power to be taken away. That was the whole time. Now, remember, this Herod is an individual that rules for the Roman government. Jerusalem and all of Israel was a defeated people. They didn't have rulers of their own. They were part of the Roman parliament. They were part of the Roman, uh, the, the entire Roman Empire. And that's what upset him. Uh-oh, my gig's up. If there's a king rising up over here, I'm no longer top dog. You know, you know, you know what leads to a idea that you want to be in full control is vanity. That, that's what leads to it. And we better be very ca cautious of vanity. And, and so this vain king was upset that the possibility of another ruler was on the way. I also want you to see who else is upset with them, and that's Jerusalem, the very center of Jewish activity. Because see, the, and you remember on the night before the Lord Jesus Christ, or the day of Jesus' uh, uh, crucifixion, uh, they wanted him dead. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, it was the Jews that went to the Roman governor and said, kill him. It, it wasn't the Roman people. He was ready to let him go. But the Jews says, I want him dead. And that's exactly what happened. 
And so the reason they were upset, they didn't want the apple cart upset. You know what? We live, we live in a day and age, if everything don't go to da to da to da we get there, we sing a few songs, we have a little prayer, we have some Sunday school, we have some preaching, we go home, eat a bite. You know, if it don't go just like that, then everybody's upset, and if you do anything else, you're a strange bird. But I want you to see that's the very same problem they were having then. They were scared. Man, they, uh, th this is not right. They're, do they're doing things. They're worshiping without going to the temple. They're worshiping without sacrifice. This is upsetting to me. And so all of Jerusalem got tore up because these men of the east came down and what their desire was was to worship Christ. You know what? Most Baptists today, if we came in the frame of mind to worship, it would upset a bunch of other so-called Baptists. And so you had to kind of question yourself while you came. Verse 4, and when he, meaning the Herod of that day, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. He wanted to know the prophecy. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art thou not least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor, and shall rule my people Israel. Now I want you to see the verses, and that wasn't the only verse predicting Christ, but what the Jews give to the leader was the one about government. And you know why? They were just fueling his fire. You better be careful, Herod. He wants to be governor. He wants to be prince. You better be careful. Lighten the fire when Christ was true. And see, I want you to see that that ultimately led to the Lord Jesus Christ offering himself on the cross of Calvary. But I want you to see how far back that plan went. Verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them di diligently uh, what time the star appeared. Now again, I want you to see, I don't know the nature of these men, but they were stargazers. Mm -hmm. And that can be good and that can be bad. Uh, you, you know, uh, a lot of what we call horoscopes, and you better keep away from them, is nothing more than stargazing. So I don't know what the origin of these people were, but we find Herod say, when this thing show up? And, and, and they told him about two years ago. So either they had been in transit for two years, or they had uh, been planning for two years to come. Now, how long have you been planning to meet with Christ? Like, well, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, and usually I don't either. Because most of the time we don't put any plans into it at all. We know Sunday morning at 10 o'clock we're at church. That's not planning. That's not preparing. And, and, and so we find then that they, uh, whatever kind of people they were, they had no stargazing about them. And so they give this information uh, to the ruling person. Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Now we know what his plan was. It was to kill the Lord Jesus Christ as an infant, and we know that they followed through and killed all the males younger than two in that time and in that place because the Lord God of heaven had already made them an escape uh, to the place so they get away from them. But I want you to see the very one that wanted to kill him, Herod, with the very plan to take him out, says, hey, I want to come worship him. You know what that says to me? Anybody can say it. Yeah. Anybody can say, hey, I come to worship and be just as full as the devils they can be. I know where Satan's seat is. That's, that, that's what 
the uh, uh, the inspiration, uh, the inspired writing of John to the seven churches of Asia. He says, I know where Satan's seat is. Mm -hmm. and, and so we find then, it has to get back to this, why'd you come? Do we know what worship is about? In 2020, do we really even know what it's about anymore? And I'm, I'm not certain we do. Uh, I think we've got a little bit too used to routine and too used to, oh, this is how it ought to be. But the thing of it is, the way that we frame out our services, and again, I believe everything should be done decently in order. But you know what? Having this first and that second and that third, there's no Bible to it. Never are we ever laid out one way to have a church service or to worship God. Never whatsoever. Uh, and, and so what I ask you, and it comes from the heart, did you really come to worship? Did you really come to lift up Jesus' name? We are come to worship. So this part of worship meant business to these individuals. Verse 9, and when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, can you imagine all of those months and all that time they were traveling and the star was saying, go this way and go that way and go this way, and finally it stood still right over, right over the uh, house where they were. See, that's the next element. Be led of God. And whatever he tells you to do, you do it. If it sounds ridiculous, do it anyway. If it sounds stupid, because see, what, I, what we're going to see about worship is that it offends the flesh. It bothers the flesh. And you know what? From what I can read about it and what I've learned about it, it all gets back to humility. We don't want to be embarrassed, do we? Right. We don't, we, we don't want to be different. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't want to look strange to the rest of the people around. And, and I think that's our biggest hindrance in 2020 is that we want to fit in. You know what that's called in the modern day? Peer pressure, right? You think it could be church pressure? Do you think it could be uh, a thing such as uh, 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 this is how we've always done it pressure? I believe there is. I, I think that's almost a certainty in the day that we live. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now the star quit moving. It's over the little house where they live. And they were like, Woo! We're here, we're here, we're here. You ever do that when you get to church? I'm too busy unloading Joey, right? Ladies are too busy getting the pots out of the car, right? I'm just saying, I don't mean it bad, but I, I know the reality of life. But what they did, whoo, we've made it. We've arrived at the place. We're going to meet Christ. We're going to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. We've made it. And you know why? You know why that we don't do that? We don't anticipate meeting him when we get there. See, they, they were full of anticipation. They, they were excited. You know what? I bet if you walked or, or rode across the desert 500 miles, you'd be pretty excited when the journey ended too. And so we find, before even going into the, the house where, where Jesus and Mary and Joseph lived, they were done rejoicing in the Lord. Verse 11. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down. <laughs> you ever done that before? Don't lie to me. I know you ain't. I, I grew up in a group, a church that weren't Baptists, and I've never seen anybody fall down. What's that sound like, Jared? Sounds Pentecostal to me, don't you? 
If you don't believe that, go down there where Mama goes. Only bunch I know that does it. Right? But they did this. Right there in front of the very living Son of God. And that was worship. That was worship. And so we find then that, that the first thing, at least the, uh, an elementary thing of worship, is bowing before the King. Bowing before Christ. Letting Him uh, know that He is God. Uh, I've been to a Mennonite service at least once, maybe twice, down there at Paris. And, and they're sitting there, and when it comes time to pray, everybody turns around at their own pew and does like this. See, they're bowing to worship. See, prayer is important to them. And most of the time, we pray standing up, and myself included. You know, I used to always kneel to pray, but these old needs just about give out on me. Even the one I had worked on, I think it needs a little something else done to me. And you know what I found that to be? An excuse. As long as you're looking for an excuse, I guarantee you you'll find one. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that probably most of what we do, and listen, this don't have to be in church. This don't have to be in the meeting house. Where were they? They were in some little house, no doubt, that Joseph had rented, and they were fixing to hightail it out of there to get to Egypt uh, for a couple of years so they could get away from the wrath of Herod. And so in this little house, wherever they were living, we find a group of men come in, and they came in to worship the king. That was the business that they had to do. And they fell down and worshiped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they, prepared, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now that's a gift. A little boy, a little child, be like handing Andrew, I mean, excuse me, AJ, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. My guess is AJ wouldn't know what to do with it unless he played with it and put it in his mouth. So it probably was given to his parents in good keeping. I think I know the purpose of it, in fact. But I want you to see they give from what they had. Yes. Now, I don't have a whole lot. First of all, I'll say this, and you can write her down and study it this week. It wasn't their tithe because the church didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So, it was a true gift of worship. What's your gift of worship? Paying attention? Just saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Bible says this, I would that men everywhere would lift holy hands. How many have seen that in Sovereign Grace churches? They'd run you out with a stick, I would say. But they don't have any Bible for that. I mean running you out with a stick. And, and, and so I want you to see that the first response was to give something of themselves. I ask you... They knelt down, and second thing, give something of themselves. What have you given of yourself to this service? What have you given of yourself to the day that we've set aside to worship here on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week? What have you given of yourself to worship the Lord? Because you will not worship Him. You will not be filled with the Holy Ghost until you bring something of yourself and, and, and throw it down before the Lord. Now, I'll give you a, a, a thought concerning those gifts. Now, I personally think they financed the trip to Egypt. Because, see, when you were in Egypt, you didn't work if you were a Jew. And they were down there about two years, maybe a little more. They needed something to live on. You see how God always provides you see, do you see how he always does something? Because listen, those items were costly. They, they, were, they were expensive things to have. And God probably provided in that way by the gifts of these men that came. You see, God is going to use that. If you choose to worship this morning, God will use it 
for the edifying of his people. Gospel of Matthew, again, this time a little further over. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. The Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching, and saith unto them, All these things will I give thee, this is the devil, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, I want you to see, if we're desiring personable, personal edification, it's a trait of Satan himself. And you have to be very, very careful. And I want you to see the bowing again. See, that's elementary to worship. He said, just bow down and worship me, and the whole ball of wax is yours. You know who people bow before today? The Pope and the Cardinals. They love that worship. Mother Teresa, everybody thought, oh, she was, I saw a Baptist preacher quote with Mother Teresa the other day. I'm like, God help me. People worship her, don't they? She's been dead for, what, 25 years? Still, that's all you hear. She's worshiped. I guarantee you, if you went to her grave site, you'd find some good Catholics down there doing this just right here. That's, that's preserved for Christ and God. They don't belong to them. And, and so we find then that, that there is an inner desire of fallen man. We like to be praised ourselves. We like to be, uh, um, we like to kind of be worshipped. You know, most Baptist churches during the last prayer, the, the preacher heads for the back door, and all people that are dismissed uh, run by. I don't see nothing wrong with that. A little formality in my taste. But anyway, there's nothing really wrong with it. But see, the thing if you do, and y'all all done this, I know you have, you go by and you shake hand, brother, I really enjoyed that message. Well, did you? Yeah. First of all, did you? And secondly, it's this right here. Right. Right. Oh, man, you're worshiping him. And man, I've seen some good preaching in my years. And, you know, and that wrong thing, you know, but I try to, every time somebody says that, well, give the Lord the praise. Yeah. You know why? Because he's the one who deserves it, not me. Right. The Bible says I'm just a mouthpiece. Uh, and, and, and so we find then that Satan is out there and men are out there desiring praise as well. Jesus answers Satan and says, then Jesus saith, then Jesus, then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Go over to 8 with me, Matthew chapter 8. And really the Bible doesn't have as much in the New Testament to say about worship as you might think. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, what was the leper's worship? It was acknowledging the power, the all-enduring power, nothing interfering, the power of Christ. Right. If thou wilt. Makes me whole. So how powerful do you think Christ is? Now, you know, I hear a lot of people, uh, you know, and, and, and there's really no splitting hairs, but they believe in the sovereignty of God, but do they believe in the sovereignty of Christ? Because he's just as sovereign. Remember what he said? I think it, I can't remember which apostle, it, I mean, disciple it was now. But he said to him, he said, I saw you under that tree this morning. You remember that? He knows where you're at and he knows what you're doing. Because why? He's sovereign. Mm -hmm. he, he knows all things. Now I want you to see this leper had enough understanding that says if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can make me whole. He didn't demand of God. And you know why? I believe that little leper understood that you can't demand anything from God. You can ask him, but you're not going to make it. And, and so we find then uh, 
<laughs> Another thing is understanding that the Lord Jesus Christ doeth whatever seemeth good unto himself. And uh, this young leper understood that. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 in uh, verse 33. Matthew 14 and 33, the Bible says, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now, you know this, and we won't get into the story too deeply, but they were rowing, rowing all night, and winds were contrary. Uh, and the Lord was down in the floor of the ship. It wasn't the walking on the sea incident. It was the going down incident. It says there's just as much water inside the ship as there was outside. And they went down there and broke up Jesus and said, Lord, carest not that we perish. And he said, what? Oh, ye of little faith. First of all, then, there has to be some faith involved in worship. Are we worshiping God? Are we just going through the motions? Are we approaching the very Jehovah God, the Father, the very God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the very God, and everybody gets upset on this one, the Holy Ghost. We're approaching all three, are we not? And we go to Him and we worship. And so we find that, and you know the rest of that, he just walks up there and says, peace be still. And because of his display of his work, his disciples ran over there and began to worship him. See, experience will teach you to worship God. If you don't believe that, have a, have a child sick, nothing left to do. You'll learn to worship him. Now, I'm just asking the healing of that child, you'll learn to worship him. And, and, and so we find then that experience very often leads, leads to worship. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 25, just a little further over. Matthew 15 and verse 25. The Bible says, And she came, then, then came she, and worshipped him, and worshiped him, saying, Lord, Help me. Now, here we find the woman coming. Very simple statement. You, you'll miss the worship in it if, you don't, if you're not careful. Lord, help me. You know what? When you need help, that's acknowledging that you can't do it on your own. That you've gone about as far as you can go. See, we need help this morning. We need help to worship. There's not a one of you under the sound of my voice, and we all know each other very well. But there's some things you don't know about me that I may be going through, and there's some things I don't know about you that you may be enduring. And the only person you go to is say, Lord, help me. Mm -hmm. Help me. And see, acknowledging our inadequacies and letting God know, hey, I need your help, it's very worshiping to him. It shows our inadequacies and his sovereignty. He has the answer for everything this morning. And that is what we need. That's worshipful when we ask for some help in the things of God. Uh, Matthew 28, after the resurrection. Matthew 28, and verse 9. 28 verse 9, the Bible says, And as they went to tell the disciples, and that means those four women, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came to him and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Where are they at again? Down here, holding the feet of Jesus. Think about that. What had, what had Jesus just been through? Anybody like blood? Don't bother me a bit. I wouldn't say I like it. But don't bother me a bit. Andrew, if he's not with us this morning, he can't handle it. And I said, well, don't go into nursing, Andrew. Uh, 
You want to hold some bloody feet? Feet, feet ain't the cleanest thing to start with. What they're bloody. See, so you're going to have to abase yourself and get a hold of the feet of Jesus. And again, I want you to see the kneeling position they're in. They're in a position that shows reverence unto the Lord God Almighty, that shows reverence unto the King, and they're there at His feet, worshiping Him as they should. Drop down to verse 17. The Bible says this, And when they saw Him, they worshiped Him, but some doubted. Now, this morning, if I got down and I said, Blessed be the Most High of the Lord, some of you are going to doubt. Right? Just calling a spade a spade, right? So if we had something like that, are there doubters among us? You know, see, the Lord Jesus Christ took care of Thomas's doubt, didn't he? And I really believe if we come into him and worship, he'll take care of yours too. And, and so we find then that most, uh, that uh, a lot of what we see in this is just abasing ourselves and getting rid of the doubt, getting rid of what's wrong and what's right in man's eyes and simply worshiping the Lord. Now, I want you to look at me in Acts chapter 18 and we'll close up here in a minute. And I want to show you a couple of things why people probably don't like it. Acts 18 and verse 13. Acts 18 and verse 13. And saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Now the person there, the person that they're talking about is Timothy. And say, you know what? It's Timothy here. He's worshiping, teaching his bunch to worship against the law. In other words, they didn't come with a sacrifice. They didn't have their turtle doves. They didn't have their lamb that wasn't cut up. What's wrong? See, that's most of us today, is it not? You know what? Uh, I really, uh, and some of you may have seen it uh, uh, on Facebook, but... I saw a primitive Baptist meeting kind of in progress, and uh, I always thought primitive Baptists were like this. You know, worse off than we are. You know, they don't use music. But man, them people worship. Had them hands up, men down around the building praying, uh, and that's just for the man up there preaching. See, they were worshiping. I don't think they were doing it to be seen. I don't think they were doing it to be heard. Yeah. I think they were worshiping. And you know what? That's good. That's good. And so I find from this verse, a lot of what we do is stuff we've been hung up on because it's all we know. It's all we've ever seen. All we've ever done. And so we find then sometime maybe what we're going to have to do is break the tournament. Because see, the way that, and again, I don't mind order, but there ain't no biblical way to have a service as far as the order and what we do and what we say and all that. So maybe we should come just to worship, just to put him before the throne. Gospel of Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to close. Gospel of Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. Oh. Matthew 15 and verse 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now I love good doctrine. God's in control. The atonement was for his people. The church was set up way before Pentecost. 
I like all those good things. But you know what? There's no doctrine. No doctrine to say you come in and you do this, then you do this, and then you do this. None whatsoever. You know what we've been taught? The doctrines of man. Mm. Yeah. Right. Taking it, oh man, that must be the way it is. I don't find it in the scripture. Not at all. You know, when the churches were meeting in people's houses, how, how did that go? Remember it was Priscilla and Aquila and the church that was in their house? Remember in Acts chapter 3, and they met house to house. Do you think it was like this? That's do, 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 do. I don't know. I don't think so. We're not given an outline, but we are coming to worship. And if we come for anything less, we're not going to leave here full. We're going to be leaving here, you know, dreary. Because see, when we worship, we're going to get recharged. Who, which of the two sisters doubted the resurrection? Martha, right? You ever think she got plugged in, sitting in his feet? See, Martha doubted, didn't she? Because she was always doing something else. Lord, I know I'll see him again in the kingdom. All that bunch is in there. The Bible says, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He wasn't weeping over Lazarus. He knew Lazarus was going to die. In fact, he appointed that he died. Why did he, why did he wait? They're unbelief. Their lack of confidence. So what about you this morning? Did you come to worship? Or one more Sunday to check off the list, I was down at New Testament. Why did you come? When are we going to lift him up? When are we going to give him praise? Maybe even go a little further. When are we going to be down on our knees? Mm -hmm. 